And this is 91.3 WYEP. I'm Rosemary, and I am in the big studio with fine WYEP members. And we are very, very thrilled. It's not every day that something like this happens that we get to welcome to our studios uh, the artist that we named as our Artist of the Year. Every year, WYEP goes through the albums we've played, the artists we've played, we pick the top 50, and then one person is chosen as our number one. And Michael Kiwanuka and his beautiful album, Love and Hate, hit the top for us. He's at the uh, Dollar Bank stage tonight at the Three Rivers Arts Festival. Welcome to Pittsburgh, Michael. Hi, how's it going? It's great <laughs> now that you're here. <laughs> it's nice to be here, yeah. And even nicer to um, uh, to learn about the um, being number one last year. So I'll play right into a song now. This one's called Cold Little Heart.
Thank you. Ninety-one-three WYEP. We're here with Michael Kiwanuka, who's playing at the Three Rivers Arts Festival tonight, the Dollar Bank Stage. So you get a chance to go down. And uh, do you, are you with the full band tonight? Yeah, there's um, this full band. We're in the middle of a tour, and there's six of us, including me. So yeah, they're a really good band. So it should be fun. There's there's been a, a little adjustment here too. Like that song that mm -hmm. you just did. That's the abridged version. Yeah, yeah. That it's opens long. the new record, right? Yeah. So Colo Hearts the first song of the album but it's, it's going to be quite a bit longer than what I just played on the acoustic this is the kind of acoustic shortened and stripped down version so uh, but tonight you'll, you'll hear the whole thing you know you know the first album that you put out which was called Home mm -hmm. uh, we, that made it to number 12 on our top 50 list Amazing. and then there was this four year gap yeah. and then comes Love and Hate so I thought oh Michael Kiwanuka's back I popped the song in uh, the CD in and that first song comes out, mm -hmm. and it's 10 minutes. <laughs> and it's five minutes before your voice comes in, and there's these gorgeous choirs of women and strings, and I thought, okay, yeah. is there a declarative <laughs> statement being made here? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was definitely fun to, um, well, it's fun to make both albums. It was definitely fun to make this one, and uh, with, with the second album, I guess. Um, well, I, I always say to people with the difference between when you're just making music and then you release like an album and people, you know, talk about it or whatever, is you never really, it's the first time you kind of think of the music objectively or hear what people, people saying stuff about you, or, um, good and bad. And you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but you, it does make you um, think a little. So people can either, I don't, I don't want to say pigeonhole, but people expect, oh, this person is this kind of music or that guy does this and that. And um, people definitely make their decision or assumption about you straight away. So when you make a second album, it's the first time you're making music with that happening. So it's quite fun because you can do things that people haven't discovered yet. Like just being a human being, if you meet someone in the playground at school, you know, you don't, you can't know everything about them in the first meeting, you know, the first week. You kind of hang, hang out with someone for a while and then you think, oh yeah, this person's got way more than just one facet. So when you make your second album, it's quite fun to, to to do that and and um, see what happens and so Cold Little Heart and the guitar playing and the length of the songs and all that kind of thing was something I wanted to a side of me that I wanted to show to kind of make people that kind of pigeonholed me think twice you know it's, it, yeah you've created quite a new playground yeah. there's a lot of new slides and things to check out on this one yeah. uh, the first album uh, Home as I was listening to it it felt a lot like uh, a search for identity that there were a lot of questions yeah. that were being asked this one it, would you say that this album is coming to some of the answers about identity uh, some, so some of it yeah you know um, I think musically um you know, just the music, you know, maybe that that's there, but in terms of um, just me, it's still still kind of searching, I guess. Um, but musically, I'm a bit more, a bit more confident in the studio, try new things out and gain confidence in the studio. It wasn't so, it wasn't like that all the way through, you know, it was towards the end where things started to make sense, but because of that experience or that journey in those four years, or, you know, however long it took to make the album, you kind of, you definitely learn more about or who you are as an artist or a musician, but in terms of the lyrics and what the songs are about, it's still definitely searching that identity and comes to terms with it a bit more maybe than the first, but it still asks those questions. Well, I, I'm sure that it would be pretty difficult to separate who you are as a person and what you're doing as a musician. Those things have to be tied together. Yeah, they they definitely are for for um, for me and a lot of the artists that I look up to that around now have been, you know, they've they're one in the same thing, so your your life or who you are is in your music, which is which is good and and the way it's supposed to be, but sometimes a little scary because you just you know you can you, most people like to have that you know what's the word I guess comfort of you can shut the door and no one you know no one really knows you, but with music you, it just comes out so people ask you more questions like did you really feel like that yesterday? It's like what's that song so sad? What happened or well, you don't do that in normal life, you know. Like, what's what's happened? What's wrong with Mike? You know, <laughs> our friend's mom said that. You know, she told me that she was like, he came and said he came and he came and 
he said, I like the new album and stuff. And he said, but my, you know, his mum liked the first album. And he was like, but you know, is Michael all right? Because this is, this is quite sad. Can you tell him to make, <laughs> and he said, can you tell him to make a happy album, you know? Because it's too sad, this one. So things like that, that's funny, but sometimes you get a bit more searching questions, but. Well, you know, music is a, a very emotional, passionate form of communication. And people, yeah. you're going to put something out there and people are going to listen to it. And they're going to hear what, what, what's in your song it might have come from you, but it's, it's eliciting something else from yeah. somebody else. Yeah, exactly. That's the crazy thing. You know, you, you'd be seeing it from your whole own experience that only you've had. And then people that you've never met, you know, can, can relate to that. But that's what's cool about I guess being a human, you know, is that we all really have quite, we can relate, that's how we relate to each other, is that we feel like similar things at different times, and you do have different experiences, but you can empathize, and I think when people listen to music or see any kind of art, the best stuff is that, is when you can kind of see yourself in, or can recognize or relate to the experience, you know, when people say, that sounds like that person singing my whole life, whatever, you know. Even though they're not, it's just something about it. Now, you grew up, what, around the London area? Yeah, North London, yeah. But your parents, they escaped Uganda when Idi Amin was yeah. the dictator there. What did you learn from that? I mean, they're, you grew up in London, that's your home. But yeah. for them, home is yeah. somewhere far away. So how does that end up? What do you learn yeah. from that? What do they instill in you? Yeah, so, I don't know. I'm still, kind of, that question I'm still kind of working out and maybe, you know, in the, this last album, that's one of the, some of the things that I'm, exp you know, I'm trying to get to come to grips with, you know, obviously with songs like, you know, Black Man and White World, um, it, it talks, it's kind of, I'm th talking about that in some way, but they, they just, um, you know, they moved to the UK and there was, op in the 70s and the 80s, there was opportunities in the UK where you could get basically the work that, well, for my mum, it'd be the work that actual British people wouldn't do, you know. So you could get good money, but you know, the pound in like the Uganda shilling, there's way more. You know, ten pounds goes a long way. So, so it was opportunities. You know, loads of them. It's kind of a bit crazier now because everyone's worked out. So the whole Brexit thing. But but back then it was, back then it was cool. You know, you could just kind of go and you could find places to live. And um, so the opportunities were high, whereas in Uganda it was like declining with Idi Amin. There wasn't even stuff in the shops, you know, that you could buy, like salt and things like that, basic things. So it was good. And then, but for me growing up, it was interesting when you got to, when you got to, I got to like teenage, well, my whole life, but the teenage years, you you do realize it's li things were a little different. The area I grew up in was really British. But you, then when we got into our house, it was like another, you know, different food, different language. But I couldn't speak my mum and dad's language because of school, because you we needs to be good at English. You know, all these things that maybe people that didn't understand were happening that I thought was every day until I got to like my teenage years and you start questioning whether you, well, maybe I should have grown up in Uganda or am I English, am I not? All these normal things, you know, trying to fit in. So you just, you just have an interesting view of identity. You know, you never really, you're British, but you're kind of not, and then you're Ugandan, but you're kind of not, so. You're just your own thing, which, which is what's cool about music, because you can, I found a lot of my identity in playing playing music, playing guitar, and it didn't seem to be so specific, you know, with rock and roll stars or soul stars, they just kind of were oddballs anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> if you've tuned in and, and you're wondering who we're talking to, it's Michael Kiwanuka, who is WIP's Artist of the Year for 2016, Love and Hate, the album, and he'll be playing at the Three Rivers Arts Festival at the Dollar Bank stage. We've got a lot more things to talk about, but we want to hear another song, Michael, please. Yeah, yeah. this next one, one of my favorites on the album, this is called The Final Frame. Games didn't know one. It's 
A lot of haunting songs on Michael Kiwanuka's album, Love and Hate. And we are lucky enough to have Michael here today performing live for us. And he's playing at the Three Rivers Arts Festival tonight. Got to talk about that song, Black yeah. Man in a White World. Yeah. That is an amazing song. And one of the things that I think makes it powerful is how much you limit the language in it. Oh, yeah. You're not telling a whole story. You're not giving lots of details. Yeah. And that that phrase, black man in a white world, is is repeated. Yeah. And, and it makes it very, very powerful. Was there a point where you were thinking about adding more content, or did you say, no, this doesn't need to have a lot of words. I've got a, a message here, and I think it's clear. Um, well, yeah, there was a there was a point where um, I thought I should um, add more content and be be more descriptive. I had other versions of um, lyrics, you know, different lyrics for extra verses and stuff or things that I'll do. So, cause I had, I had um, the original demo of it, you know, was just the first kind of lines that popped, popped into my head, you know, um, and I was, you know, I did that in the studio. I was doing, I was writing that song with my a producer, a friend Inflow, and um, you know, he encouraged the song and was recording at the time. And then, um, and so I was just throwing down words and sometimes he would shout like a word for a verse and it would be like, oh, that sounds good. And it just kind of came out. And then um, we had this demo thing for about quite a long time, you know, eight months or so. And so I, it was in my head, I was always like, well, you know, I'll finish this properly and do some new lyrics and and be more descriptive. But 
as you got to an end making the album, it just felt like it would, every time I tried to change it, I even did versions, recorded different versions away from the demo, you know, just never sounded as, as good. So um, I went back to that and just used the beginning of that and then just finished it off with the breakdown that it's on the album and then the chorus again, you know, and then I never did any more lyrics in the end because sometimes I just think um, you need, you know, the, the main concern when I first wrote the song, I came up with the chorus was, I hope it doesn't exclude loads of people because of the, what the lyrics say and, and just the way it is in culture now or, or the the way it happens is the kind of music that I play, this is from the UK, I don't, can't speak for everywhere, but to be fair, with most places where I tour, the kind of music I play, it's not, there's not that many black people coming to my gigs or listening to my music really, or younger ones anyway. So uh, I thought, well, I wonder how that will go down at one of my gigs because people might just think I hate white people or something, which isn't, which isn't what the song's about. So I thought I had to be more descriptive, but then, and then it's just to explain, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't hate, you know, but then when you do that, it's like, you should, I don't think you should apologize for, or you even think that, you know, an audience is stupid, you know, sometimes when you, know, you watch a film or listen to something, you think the people make it just think the audience is so stupid, they have to spell everything out, you know, like, not that canned laughter is bad, but it's like canned laughter, you know, laugh now. It's just, I didn't think you need to do that, so I thought, and then, and then on top of that, as we were finishing, I thought this would be more inclusive too, actually, because the less descriptive I am, the more someone from, from whatever colour or background they are could relate to the song, because really it's just about feeling like you don't really, you're on your own little path, which is really what everyone is on anyway. And I think it's the culture makes us feel like we have to be like whatever it is that's around us. And I'm English, so like I have an ale and like a steak and kidney pie or I'm Ugandan and so I have like rice all the time, you know, but that's just what is around us and forced upon us, but it doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily who you are. So I thought the less you describe, the more anyone could really, you know, be interested into the song, you know. And then it just leaves a bit more to the imagination, which is always good for anything creative, I think. It's pretty amazing when uh, it becomes political simply to state a very simple fact, I'm a black man in a white world. Yeah, yeah, I guess. That's quite descriptive in that sense, so, yeah. Let's go back now. I want to go back to, um, you started with guitar. Yeah. You weren't a singer or a songwriter at first. It was guitar, and I, I understand you started on electric? Yeah, yeah. The first guitar I got was a electric, um, sunburst electric guitar, cheap, a Fender copy. So you're a serious, you know, no acoustic guitar for me. I'm going to go right into the electric. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, you wouldn't believe it, but I saw Assembly, or, I don't know if you call it that in America, in school when you have like a meeting assembly. Yeah, they, um, they year in like the first year of secondary school, there was a band in a few years above me that performed three songs, like one corn song and two Marilyn Manson songs. You wouldn't believe that. <laughs> and they're, they're, but none of them, no one was singing. It was my friend's brother was playing drums, he was a good drummer and they just played these electric instruments and the guy, this, the guy Scott Edwards played this <laughs> thing on, you know, when you get your, fret, your plectrum across the electric guitar, it does that cool sound. I was like, whoa, and then I went home and <laughs> got an electric guitar <laughs> about six months later. So bought into that. And then you were a session player. Yeah. So a session player gives you sort of a, an in long before you're recording your own stuff. Yeah. You're sitting in and you're watching what other people are going to do. You yeah. have to take some of that experience. And when you finally get to your turn to do it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there already. Yeah, it helps. It wasn't like planned like that really, but, but, it, but then when you started making the first album, it was... It made it easier because you can play, you've been in a studio before and you can, um, because the studio is quite different to performing live. So you, you know, all the microphones and the red light stuff is quite scary. So, but you, I've had experience that and then it allowed me to play, you know, the, the main thing what was cool was that it allowed me to have a bit more control. So um, I could play a bit of bass and I could play some guitars and I could play like basic, basic keyboards. So when you were making music, you could you didn't have what happens often when you're young. People just say you need to do it like that, or you don't do that, and you, the alpha people in the room take over. But if you can play stuff, you just can do it yourself without anyone getting involved, and you can say what you you hear a bit quicker. So that really helped in that sense. Yeah, yeah. and then at some point you decide to become a singer, and you know that it takes. We've talked about identity, but it takes confidence. You know, you have to first of all discover what that voice is for you. Yeah. And then you have to trust it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so again, it was. It was. Um, I remember the first 
time I, I, mean, I had, a, I'd just written a few songs and then I was, I was um, hanging out with some friends in, in Hackney at in East London, which is an area in East London in, in, in England. And I was just a session player, so we, but my friend had the keys to, he, he, it was like a music, youth music program. And we were like 20, 19, so it was for younger people. So my friend Stephen had the keys, he was a teacher. So he had the keys to all the practice rooms so we could play until like 1 a.m. We could just go in at like really late and play and it was soundproofed, it was part of a big old, so no one would complain. So we, would, we were always in there like playing. But they also had little studios, um, like little Mac set up and you could, you could record your own little demos. And they had a little, you know, studio with a desk in it. And I kept looking at it thinking, I've just started writing songs and people are coming in singing, I wanna, I wanna record my, my, a song. But I was so nervous and I didn't really know. I'd written a song that was too high for my range, but I didn't understand like ranges yet. So I just couldn't sing it, but I didn't know that you could just lower the key <laughs> for the thing. So I started singing it and the guy, the guy who like runs, everyone was like proper like gospel singers, they could really do everything. So, and they were like, this is, you know, this isn't sounding very, I did about five takes and they were like, this isn't really sounding very good. Maybe, maybe I should do it. So some guy just started singing the song that I'd written I was like, you can't just sing my own. S I mean, I wanted to sing my own song for that, and he and he just did a recording, and I was obviously so dejected and went home, thinking, oh, it's not. This is singing thing is obviously isn't for me. But that's it. You just kind of through that you find your own voice. I I then just started recording at home, on my laptop in the mic, and just found out that if I just sing a bit lower, it doesn't sound too bad. And I sent it to someone else online and said, could I have some some demos? Could I do some demos at your studio? And he was like, you got a good voice and they gave me confidence and I just practiced, you know. So you, you find it in like hodgepodge ways, but that was quite funny. They told me you can't sing, you know. But I didn't know, you just had to, I didn't know about keys like that. You showed them though, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was good. He came to a gig actually, so that was all right, the guy that sang instead of me. <laughs> yeah. And I noticed on the, on the first record, um, I went back and listened to it, and the guitar work is beautiful, but it's more subtle. This record, you're letting that baby sing. Yeah. Yeah, I love the guitar again. That it's not quite Marilyn Manson now, but still the electric guitar still just got <laughs> still got an, a, a hold on on me. But it's funny. Um, this is what I mean by identity. People do like just to tell you what you are straight away. So yeah, I don't know what it is about us, but we go, like, "Well, you can't do that." You know, you just kind of assume that, which always annoyed me. And I remember when I, I went to uni, secondary to to try and study like jazz guitar. And um, I thought jazz was like the classical music of like pop because I couldn't do classical. But if I did jazz, it would be like you, you had to do like, you know, difficult scales and stuff. So it was like posh and everything like that. So I practiced every day. I love jazz and I just practiced. So I got into this music college and then I just got in and they they were like, you, I couldn't do it the way they were, they were doing it. It was a bit more classical based or a bit more old school. Um, so I dropped out of that. But everyone, the teachers kept saying like, well, you know, you know, you know, you you haven't really got that together. Or you can't really do that. Same as that singer guy. Um, so I left, um, and I and then I started to just write songs again, and that's when it, I just did that. So I put guitar on the back burner. Thought I'm not really a guitar player. Uh, it was a good dream, but you know, I can just pretend to do that in my bedroom and listen to Hendrix records. But then when I started the second album, I'd always play my electric to do the rhythm parts, and Brian Burton, the producer. Danger Mouse, he like loves, he's, we're quite similar in a sense, I guess he just loves like British guitar bands. So he's like obsessed with Pink Floyd, The Smiths, um, The Clash, anything that's like Hendrix, um, Funkadelic and like Eddie Hazel, stuff like that, which, which in the, as I was growing up, I like loved all that stuff. So it was like, well, you can play a guitar. And he just thought it was great. And it, it was he didn't want to hear something complicated or amazing. He just wanted to hear, he just like, you can play. You just, you need to put loads of that on your album. That's like, as a, in a way, a selling point because he's always like he's a great producer, but he's always thinking about, you know, he understands how people buy records and and so he was just like play and I just all those fears of all those down thoughts of when the teachers were like you can't do it I just left and I was like just couldn't get enough of it so the, I had a ten minute intro and I thought oh all of that you know so it's quite fun and getting to play electric now but that's what happened Brian was the big influence for that he discovered I could play and it was like dude you should just play and it's it's fun and. I think we just want to be, deep down, we both just want to be rock and roll stars. 
<laughs> it's good to have a producer who figures out yeah. what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he brings it out cool. of people. Yeah. Well, if you just tuned in, um, it's Michael Kiwanuka. The album Love and Hate is beautiful. I highly recommend it. Uh, Dollar Bank Stage Tonight, Three Rivers Arts Festival. And you're going to hear that guitar tonight. Yeah. But to, to right now, we're going to get one more acoustic. tune from Michael uh, on acoustic. Yeah. I'm going to mm. do um, the title track. This is Love and Hate. Um,
Thank you. Michael Kiwanuka, just at the beginning of your career, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. I know you've worked with some great people already, and I'm sure there's going to be many more collaborations in your future, and we hope that we get to see you here in Pittsburgh again. Mm -hmm. If you want to check out Michael tonight, Dollar Bank Stage, Three Rivers Arts Festival, I'll see you down there, Michael. Yes, thanks for having me very much. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thanks.